I woke up this morning to find this is what it looked like on my timeline about bubble. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about the elephant in the room, bubble pricing, and also some of the things I think people aren't talking about, like the context of this whole thing and what this really means to you instead of just seeing a couple of tweets and then going crazy about pricing changes, okay? So first of all, let's talk about the context of Bubble, what it is, and why they're making a pricing change, okay? So Bubble has been a foundation piece, a great platform in the no-code space for years, and you can pretty much build anything with it. That's the bottom line. Now, why has there been a pricing change or structuring um, of all these prices in the future? Well, if you didn't know, a couple of years ago in 2021, they got a Series A and they raised $100 million. Now, why do I think this is important to even talk about right now? Well, if you are unfamiliar with VC or venture capital money, guess what? People are investing to make a profit. So their investors want to make sure that Bubble has a clear plan or a clear trajectory for profitability, for making more money. That's why they're investing. So there's going to be changes with pricing and to make sure that they're pleasing their investors. That's what happened. They were bootstrapped for a long time. They expanded. It has to make sense. Now, as we look into this, we're going to look at the context of pricing as well. Um, Bubble tried to change their pricing um, before in the last 18 months and the the community reacted. They went back on it, they talked to a lot of people, and then they decided to put out their information about their new pricing. Now, if we'll, you know, all the details you can read about and all these things, but the main problem that people have with the pricing and what's going on, uh, where they're really having trouble is, it has to do with the workflow units and understanding how they're gonna be charged. Because if you do something wrong, you can have an infinite loop, your workloads, and you can be out of a lot of money. That's what people are scared about, okay? That's, I'm simplifying it, but that that's what's going on. Now, some people thought, okay, if they complain a lot, they're going to change it again back, and then we can have this conversation. Well, uh, not so. The founder put out um, a message and they, talked about some of their concerns, but just telling you what's going to happen. Uh, Emmanuel, one of the founders, uh, says, hey, everyone, thank you for sharing your concerns. Josh and I are listening and gathering your feedback. The overall structure and direction of this new pricing will not be changing. However, we will be making adjustments to fix any issues in how we calculate workload that would make certain features of Bubble especially cost prohibitive per your feedback. We really appreciate your patience and we'll be in touch with the community through the form mid next week. I know that the wait isn't fun for anyone, bubble team included, but it's important that we take the necessary time to make sure we address the different points carefully. Okay, so they address what's going on. They're not changing the pricing, but they're going to have certain changes. Now, um, or again, what it says, um, making adjustments, fix any issues calculating the workflow, workload, excuse me. So what are some of the things people are freaking out about? Okay, so if you look at the FAQ and they put this out, and one of the lines that people keep coming back to is the workload, and this is the line that I keep seeing from the community, people are messaging me, the exact cal calculation of the workload is based on behind the scenes implementation details. But in general, and then it goes on, to tell you, um, the, well, I'll just say, but in general, the more data that gets processed in, by Bubble, both in terms of the number of things and size of things, the more workload will be consumed. Okay, so again, the workload there, it could cost you a lot of money if you do something wrong. Now you can of course reach out to their team, but a lot of people are concerned about this. Now, the team also breaks down in the form of like based on their uh users how much they would be charged with the pricing increase and all of these things but they also make a point which i thought was interesting um where it says we knew going into this that some apps would see 
very significant increases in our analysis of our user base. Our team was either able to find massive workload optimization opportunities, sometimes 95% or so, or we felt that the app represented a thriving business that could support the increased price. Okay. So that's what I really want to focus on just for a few moments. They're, they're, they got to make money too, right? And they're looking at what's going on with other businesses that are making money with Bubble. And can we also raise the price so this can be a path to profitability and still support the businesses that use Bubble? Note that they're also looking at how people are using this and they're, they're balancing out what they want to do. This is nothing new. This is nothing new. If you look at what Gumroad did, did with their pricing, although people, a lot of might say, well, it's aligning with the percentages of what people make, so it scales appropriately. But the bottom line is these companies can change things over time, and this represents a, another shift right here with Bubble. In the comments section, let me know what are you building with Bubble? Are you doing this with a side hustle? Are you scaling a SaaS, a software as a service? Are you creating a marketplace? Let me know how you're gonna be using Bubble. Okay, so we kind of talked about that and we're gonna, we're gonna go into more details in a second, but that's an overview of what's going on with Bubble, why people are upset, all of those different things. Now the question is, how do I feel about it? And um, what should you do next? All of those things. Well, I, first, I want to talk about something real quick. And that has to do with um, an article that this was published years ago talking about Twitter when they switched from Ruby on Rails. And the reason I want to mention that is I see a lot of people in the backlash that, well, now it's the time to switch. I've got, I can't be locked in on Bubble. I'm going to do something where I can code and do all these other things. Okay. Even some of the biggest SaaS companies switch switch what they're using, coding, what the platform, all those things. The thing to consider is where are you and your business and what do you want to do to, to then make a decision? Does it make sense financially to switch or to scale? No platform is perfect. No code, low code, coding, no platform is perfect. You have to have trade-offs. The trade-off with a lot of no code and low code platforms are they make it easier for you to start a business, a SaaS, a whatever, than you to code, but you are giving up freedom because you don't own that code a lot of times. Now, there are some platforms, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, that allow you to export code, but the reason that you're using these platforms, for the most part, have to do with you doing a trade off for not learning how to code. Now, Maybe some platforms, I've seen this, some go from low code or no code and then go get a developer and then you're going to be scaling from that. That's what we do with a lot of clients and students. Uh, sometimes you might have to switch and also go with a low code option. For example, a lot of times when it's marketplace, we encourage people to use Share Tribe Go, which is out of the box. It's all no code, but then we'll switch to Share Tribe Flex where it is Coding. There's components where you're going to be able to customize it, and there's a coding component to it. Just depends on what you're trying to do. So the reason I bring up with Twitter and the reason it you just there's certain things that you can't plan for, and it just you might need to switch. You might need to switch. So before I would say like you know the house is on fire. What are you using Bubble for right now? Now, if you're a hobbyist and you're just getting started and you're getting users, but this is not financially feasible, I would encourage you, how can you make money, right? Can it be sponsors? Are you going to have a pro tier something like that? What's going to happen? What's the path for you? Because before even building that MVP or anything like that, you should be testing pricing. Uh, you could be saying, Doc, I'm already in it. You should have told me that like a year ago. Now I've got users and I can't find this path. Start seeing if people are going to pay you. There's going to be, there has to be some way that you're going to make money. If you're not making money, you don't have a business. It's a hobby, right? And there's not a problem with a hobby, but there might be better solutions or other platforms that might be better for hobbyists at this time. Maybe, depends on your circumstance, depends on what you want to do. But I would say the increase in pricing 
there you're going to find this in every kind of platform that you go off after. And if you want the trade off and you're saying, listen, doc, understand what you're saying. I'm just going to spend my time coding. Okay. If you decide to go that route and you're building a SaaS or something like that, where you need to scale over time to make sure that you're maintaining the infrastructure, all those things, you're going to also have to pay for a team to maintain and troubleshoot and be on call when you also code that thing. Now, there are tons of great teams or small teams, one person founders or small uh, micro teams. But if you're focusing to scaling a SaaS, scaling a marketplace, you're going to also have to still put in place a team to make sure that it's structured and all of those things, right? Look at um, Mike Rubini, great team, uh, small team, nimble, has a portfolio of SaaS companies, very small team, be able to manage it. I'm not saying that just because it's coded that you're not going to have time. But if you're going to also um, be focused on marketing or raising capital, VC funding, or doing other things, you not worrying about the coding or errors or things changing or breaking, those are things to consider as well. Everything has a trade-off, okay? So let me know what your trade-off are. What, what do you want to do? And also, too, I see a lot of people on Twitter right now saying, well, I'm just going to go into coding right now. Just going to use GPT-4 and just build things. Okay, you can, yeah. Uh, GPT-4 isn't the answer to everything or, you know, chat GPT. It just, it's just tools. It's just tools. So think about what you need personally. Okay, so getting locked in. Some people are like, well, I'm not going to get locked in ever again. These people are lying to me. Give me some options where I won't be locked in. Well, there's a whole video that I did of five alternatives for Bubble that's probably coming out. Either it's out or there's going to be a link down below. But a couple of things to consider. You can go to platforms such as Flutterflow or Canonic, where you can actually export your code. For example, Flutterflow, it's built on Flutter, which is an open source um, uh, yeah, code, right? So it's created by Google. So if you decide to leave Flutterflow, you can export the code um, at, I think it's at their $30 uh, level. So you could build it for $0.00. Plan out, do the basic features when you're ready. If you really want to leave, you can just export the code, pay them $30, and you're gone. You can do whatever you want. Again, once you leave, though, you're going to have to know how to code and how to maintain the code and do all of those things. Or you're going to stay on Flutterflow until it's a point and then decide what you want to do and leave. Canonic, you can do the same thing. You can take your stuff with you, right? But for you, I want to talk about next steps. What are you going to be doing? Uh, what do you think about Bubble? Are you going to wait until they give more details later in the week? Or are you going to be learning how to code? Are you going to be going on a different platform? Before it's hasty and look at another shiny object or decide to go to another no-code or, or low-code platform, I'll just say one thing. They can change too, depending on what they're doing. Are they bootstrapped? Are they VC funded? A lot of these companies are still working on their price points to make a profitability. So the time where there were certain prices or there are certain units, it just changes over time. Just like if you're looking at CRMs such as MailChimp, ConvertKit, the prices have changed over time because you're exchanging convenience or some kind of functionality for, again, a trade-off. You could send emails and code and do whatever you want and create your own platform to you know do email blasts, but you're paying for convenience. You're paying for all the different amenities. Same thing when you're using low code or no code. This depends on you, depends on where you're at, and let me know how you feel. It's going to be more news if people care about this and people want me to report more about this. Uh, there are tons of other um, pricing changes with other no code platforms. If people want me to talk about it or my, uh, my thoughts on it or different alternatives for you and you are the most important person, let me know in the comment section down below. All right, everybody. Till next time. All right. Don't burn anything down. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.